So it's only 9.35 and we're able to get going. All right. So the if and we're going to start now in, in the book. It's on page 55. No. Yes, 56. And this is for this week's Torah portions, which is called Vayeda. Um, I muted everyone for background noise. If there's anything you'd like to, uh, to ask, to be able to make sure that the flow of the conversation is, is understood, there's a way for you to either Can you write in the, put the, chat. In the chat. You, you, yeah, put it in the chat, or I think there's a way to wave or something like that. Um, so, yes, you can write in the books. Uh, we'll, we'll get to this. You know. <laughs> We're rolling with the punches here. We'll figure out what's better. For next time, we'll be a little bit more organized as we get into this. Okay. So, there is a, a what's called a partial overview. And the Torah portion is, is um, the fourth from the beginning of the Torah, where the beginning of the unfolding of the biblical profile, the biblical images that we have. We went through Adam and Eve and Noah, and now we're really starting what we would call the beginning of the Hebrews, because Jews, as we know them today, technically Jews, they don't begin until Sinai. When the, when the Hebrews are Abraham and Sarah's family, the next generation is Isaac and Rebecca, and we'll be reading about these in the, in the coming weeks. But their family grows, and they have the whole Passover story in Egypt and so on, but they're really, they're not technically Jews. It's the Hebrew people. And they, they don't have the obligations of mitzvahs, and uh, uh, at least most of them. And coming to Sinai was like a mass conversion. And so here, they, while we sometimes call Abraham and Sarah the first Jews in the loose sense, technically it's not correct. It's, they, they, were, they were the first of the Hebrews, and they certainly are very, very important preliminary to the Jewish people and Jewish mindset and studying about them and not studying histories, but studying about ourselves and studying about, you know, there's an Abraham and Sarah within us and, and they, what they created and what they brought to the world is fleshed out in our Judaism, but it's very much there. They are our patriarch, our matriarch, not just in the biological sense, because for some of us, it's not in the biological sense, it's they're in the, in the spiritual sense, they're still part of us. So the overview is about the Torah portion. The Torah portion is packed, but a lot of good stuff to talk about. Um, and we're gonna, not going to talk about most of it. We're just going to zero in on one, one piece of it. But here's a, a bit of an overview, um, just for our uh, biblical literacy. It says, God reveals himself to Abraham three days after the first Jew. Don't even they call him a Jew. We can put a little asterisk there. Circumcision at age 99. There was a, it's a, in the last week's Torah portion at the end, God tells uh, Abraham that he and Sarah are going to be able to have a child together, even though that would be miraculous, that it would be possible for them. They're, they're, he's 99, she's 89, and he circumcises himself. He's told to circumcise himself. That's the first mitzvah that he had, actually, the only technical mitzvah, as it's short, as if mitzvah means a commandment, he was commanded to do any of these things. And he circumcises himself. And now the scene opens in this week's Torah portion. He's by his tent. And this is actually an important part of, of, of the narrative. Abraham and Sarah were, were lovers of humanity. That really is a very important kind of encapsulation for who they are. They're, they refer to that way scripturally also. An important, or perhaps the most important dimension that they brought to the world was this idea of caring and love and connection between people. And between people and God, they, 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 they walked into or they were born into an atmosphere of polytheism. And an atmosphere of polytheism is largely an atmosphere of fear because people, they, they were very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to the elements, vulnerable to wild animals. They, they, they lived, most of them, it was agricultural. And therefore, being a farmer is being very vulnerable. Um, because it's, you know, no rain, you do whatever you want, but there's nothing, you, you can't create that. Or maybe you can today in Israel, but it's very, it's very, it's, it was very vulnerable. And therefore, it was the, the polytheism, as we understand it, as it unfolded, was like trying to, to pacify all the forces that could hurt me. 
I'm afraid of the blight and the crops. Find that God of blight and and and, and pacify it. I'm, I'm worried about about uh, that, that there's no rain. What? How do we find that God of rain? But and take care of that. But in theory, one would think that if someone was sitting totally comfortable and not afraid about all the, these overarching forces in the world, they have no need for God. Life is good. It's because we're afraid of things. That's what we're trying to pacify God. Abraham said, God isn't about just, you know, escaping this danger or protecting ourselves from that specific force that, that threatens us. It's about a, a loving creator who loves us, created us, who's part of us, there's godliness within us, and who wants us to be able to connect with each other, created the world as, as a it's kind of a test and a mission for us to see what we can do to make this world whole and, and, and peaceful and loving and caring. So Abraham and Sarah, just on the retail end, without all the theology, one of the things is they cared about people. And they, they Abraham became a wealthy man. And one of the things that he did is he, he they set up the time they were living in the desert, which was a lot of the time, they set up like an inn in the desert, which was very necessary. People, travelers, they didn't have access to things. And he, so they, they were there giving people provisions. So here it, it says, get back to the scene as it opens up in, in the Torah portion. Again, that's not, some of this is actually what I just said is part of what we're going to talk about today. But just to look at the overview of the Torah, Abraham's sitting at the, 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 uh, opening of his tent, and he sees Abram rushes off to prepare, prepare a meal for three guests who appear in the desert. So three people show up at the inn. And here he's 99 years old, just went through surgery, but he's running off to, to try and, and make them food. One of the three, and all of these are actually angels disguised as men, one of them announces that in exactly one year, the bear and the Sarah will give birth to a son. And Sarah laughs. We're not going to touch that one today. Abraham pleads with God to spare this wicked city of Sodom. This was known as Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom was a place, it was a city which was the antithesis of, of Abraham in the sense that the cruelty was, was they waited to roll with each other and with others. And God says, I'm going to destroy this city. Two of the three angel, disguised angels arrive in the doomed city where Abraham's nephew loved, extends his hospitality to them and protects them from the evil intentions of a Sodomite mob. Two guests reveal that they've come to overturn the place and to save Lot and his family. Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt. You may have remember this a little bit in, in some biblical stories. When she disobeyed the command to not look back at the burning city of Fifty. So God does destroy the city. Um, what's beautiful there, and again, when I'm talking about it today, is that Abraham argues with God about not destroying the city, even though they're really nasty people. But Abraham stands up for them against the human suffering. And God ultimately does destroy the city. And <coughs> They, they flee. While they, taking shelter in a cave, Lot's two daughters, believing that they and their father are the only ones left alive in the world, get their father drunk, lie with him, and become pregnant. Two sons born from this incident, father of nations were Moab and Ammon. Yeah, I'm going to touch that. Abraham moves to Gerar. <laughs> no, there's plenty to talk about, but it's not, no, it's not for today. And it's, 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 uh, let's really prepare for that. Abraham moves to Gerar, where the Philistine king uh, Abimelech takes Sarah, who is presented as Abraham's sister, to his palace. In a dream, God warns Abimelech that he will die unless he returns home to her husband. Abram explains that he feared he would be killed with a beautiful Sarah. God remembers his promise to Sarah and gives her and Abraham a son who is named Isaac, Yitzchak in Hebrew, meaning will laugh. And Isaac is circumcised at the age of eight days. He's the first one to be at eight days, which is, which is the practice of the Jewish people. And we, but we don't actually, to my other point, I can't resist throwing in the points of, of uh, Jewish knowledge, we don't circumcise our children because Isaac circumcised himself at eight days, or it was circumcised at eight days, because that's really pre mitzvahs. The reason we circumcise ourselves is because that, that the Torah from Sinai were told to, to circumcise themselves in, uh, to, in memory of what happened with Abraham and, and Yitzchak. But it's, it's, we don't just do things for long because that's what they used to do. We have a question in the chat. I can't read it. The screen of words is not running with with the reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Good. Thanks for bringing that up. Because I should be doing this. Okay. Thanks. I'm gonna learn this eventually. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Click on the screen. 
Yeah, so that was almost the end. Last line says Lot's wife turns into a pillow. Oh, sorry, so, sorry. So I got to go even further. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, still technically on so, so that's not Yeah, you're on the first So column. click just on the PowerPoint itself. On the white, on the white, uh, on the white space. Okay. And now try. There sorry, you guys. <laughs> Everyone here over the age of 30 yeah, feels a yeah. tremendous kinship with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's not changing at all. No, no, no. This is our life. Except there are two people. No, <laughs> okay. okay. They're closest to the door, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> They're going on TikTok later. I was a senior citizen. But I should... <laughs> okay. So. As long as it's not Twitter. Uh, okay. Um, so. And Abraham is, is 100 years old, and Sarah 90 of their child's birth. Hagar and Ishmael are banished from Abraham's home and wander in the desert. God hears the cry of the dying lad and saves his life by showing his mother a well. You know, okay. things are switching a lot. 57. Okay. I think we're good at this. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, Abimelech makes a treaty with Abraham and Abraham gives him seven sheep as a sign of their truth. Again, we're not going to touch all this, but the, it's for your biblical literacy. You can check us out later. I have okay. a quick question. Sure. So in this paragraph it talks about where Abraham, um, Sarah was given to Abi, Abimelech, but Abimelech has a dream to return his to return Sarah back to her husband. Right. But uh, according to Abimelech, she's Abraham's his sister. Right. So in it's actually a great point. Uh, I mean, she um, the the Abimelech actually it seems like he wasn't a bad guy. He was just that's what they did. And it's when in the dream it says. That guy is not her brother, it's her husband. Oh, and then he says to Abraham, Why did you do this? Why did you set me up for this? I would never have done it. I, I thought she was she was free. Got it. Okay. No. Yeah. But thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna go forward. Whatever forward it is. Just a dumb question. Yes, yeah, no such thing. Do you have yeah. any insight in terms of what the definition of a year is? Because when you talk about ninety and a hundred and this beautiful Sarah and all this other, I mean, I mean, so it, that, that, it, that's a, a difference. It's right? a great question. So, what's the definition of a year? And especially in those early, in those early generations, I mean, this is mild compared to what we have as as, uh, as far as uh, the generations. There are those who will, you know, work that through in, in different ways of, of of how to redefine a year. It's it's a little difficult for me for me, and I'm not speaking for that. I'm not saying that those are those are invalid approaches. I would say the the, the majority of Torah approaches, the overwhelming majority of Torah approaches, are that before the flood, the human the, the human condition operated at a very different level, and therefore it's it's not our way of, of we can't even fathom it in our reality. Mm -hmm. So after the flood, you'll see Torah wise that things really go down a lot. Now, living till 127 is still a lot, but it ain't 927. So here, Abraham and Sarah and, and those generations, they live very long by our standards, but not what we call exponentially long or outrageously long. So we do see that as a year, and we'll see that there's that we see it as have there's a, a, a there's been a diminishing within the human condition. And you know, we're coming back, you know, with, with medicine and, and knowledge and nutrition, to be able to bring it back to prolong our life. But uh, humans managed to uh, just to nature and what they were doing and how they were eating and so on to, to diminish the full lifespan. So because even Moses would say 120 was was not any, was that's how we lived and was not seen as unusual. That's in the way we look at it biblically. Obviously, once it came to the times of the Talmud or someone, it was not like that at all. So you have to go and think, is it possible that, that 3,000 years ago, people lived in a well, I got, if the, if the things we, you talk about, the steps of faith, this, this is not my digs. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Yeah, but I think someone did mention, um, I, I, I did hear a rabbi, do the conversion of the years. I don't know if it was five to one or six to one. It was something scientific that we uh, talk about. There, there definitely could be those. That's, and and it's for me yeah. it, to be able to look at a Torah and and um, I'm not gonna say play with it, but to, to reframe it in a way that's that takes it out of its normal interpretation. 
I would need to feel really compelled. I don't feel compelled. But there aren't any portion that give a... No, but I'm sure this is happening. Some people may feel compelled. I don't. No problem. Go on YouTube. You'll find something. Okay. 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 So now the... When we get to this, this, um, this, uh, this discussion we have today um, is really it's it's going to get into Abraham and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah's approach, Abraham and Sarah's approach to to humanity to, to were mostly not Hebrews because they were the only Hebrews, and it's it's. Um, we want to make it relevant to talk about it for ourselves also, but this is about the idea of, of seeing within the good and the potential within humanity and the good not only as in, as in the potential of you know different skills and talents they can bring to the world, but also the idea that people our assumption is the working assumption is that people deep inside want to be good with God. And they may someone may say to me, I don't. Believe in God, I don't care about God, and I'm not going to be disrespectful and say, Yes, you do. But inside, I'm thinking, well, Maybe, you know, you know, <laughs> maybe you just have to, to, you know, help them get through some static, you know, to get there. But that, that it's at the core of the, of, of the being, the sense of connection with God. Okay. So now let's, let's get into just some of the basics right now. Abraham and Sarah, we said, the, this is from a verse, text one A is a verse in the Torah, and this Torah portion it says, he, in this case, he and she, they planted an Eshel. What is an Eshel? We'll find out in a second. An Eshel in Beersheba. So they're out in Beersheba, which is out in the desert, and he called out, he plants whatever this Eshel is, and he calls it in the name of God, the everlasting God. So he has God in mind. Again, it's Abraham and Sarah. They have God in mind to plant this Eshel. What is an Eshel? Text one B. We have from the Medrash, it says, what does it mean? Any plant of Nashal and Beersheba? Rabbi Huda and Nehemi disagreed over the translation of the word Eshel. This is not a normal Hebrew word. Rabbi Huda said, an Eshel is an orchard. Ask for anything you want, dates, gra grapes, or pomegranates. He wanted to, to feed people. So he went out into the desert and he did something unnatural. He, he managed to, you know, one of the, the first, uh, you know, ecological scientists. He's trying to figure out how to, to plant a, 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 an orchard because he wants the people to be able to have access to it out there. Abne Chemi said, an Eishel is an inn. Ask for anything you want. Bread, meat, wine, or eggs. In other words, he had, he had produce. There. The main thing was that he had this little inn going on. And he didn't, he didn't need the money. He did it. He wanted to provide for people. Okay. And in text 1c, we're trying from in the uh, in the Talmud, one of the, our great commentaries, Rashi, the primary commentary on the, the Torah in the Talmud, in the 11th century, it says Eshel is actually an acronym for three Hebrew words: Achila, Tia, and Levia. Who drink and accompany me? We'll take care of you. We're, we're your local desert hill. And we we'll take care of you, and we'll, we'll provide your needs. You are still to be Oh, but hell, wait. But why would he use the word plant? He planted. Oh, yeah, you want me to do mouse. Why don't you get mouse? You don't say like a mouse. Oh, what is it with a mouse? Pardon me. Did you do it? Want it? Oh, good idea. Sorry, give it to someone up there. No, I'm not going to do it. Listen, he doesn't really. David is one of those other 30. Okay. Mentally. It's not emotionally. <laughs> Sorry. No, so, we yeah, so yeah, 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 your idea of uh, your question is like, it does planting does denote uh, uh, planting as an, as an agriculture, and that's why that's the first opinion there in the Medish. But it, it is used um, also used biblically, much less so, of the idea of establishing family. Right. So they they, they 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 made it in. Okay, so now we go to text two. Yeah. So what would he do? He, they, they had an agenda. What was their agenda? God. Love of people and God. So what did he, if he, first of all, he was, they were serving people. When I look at text two from this week's God portion, and so then he said, 
My master, I've found favor in your eyes. Do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, bathe your feet, and recline under the tree. And let me met, fetch a morsel of bread, bread as you may refresh yourselves and go on, seeing that you have come your servant's way. And they replied, yes, do as, as you have said. Well, there's, there's these three angels who consider men. That was his thing. He was given to people. He hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, prepare three sons of choice flour, knead and make cakes. And Abram ran to the herd. He took a calf, tender and choice, gave it to the servant boy who hastened to prepare he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared. He noticed that it was beaten milk together. It's another conversation for another day. And set these before them. And he waited on them, but even though I just said that they had no mitzvahs per se, but still we talk about it. And he waited on, under, on them under the tree as they as they ate. Okay, so their agenda seems to be just giving, but they had, a, they had a, a, a larger agenda. A larger agenda was trying to bring, bring God consciousness to the world. So what did he do? Text 3a, call, it says he called on the name of God, the everlasting God. The Talmud tells us, you, you, you read this in a way where you, you change the vowelization a little bit. So that doesn't mean Rabbi Reish Lokish was a rabbi of the Talmud says, don't read it. And he called out rather, and he caused others to call out in God's name. This teaches us that Abraham, our patriarch, taught every wayfarer to call out the name of God. He was trying to get people to connect with God. How did he do that? Well, how? After they had their fill of food and drink, they would arise to thank him. He would say to them, you did not eat my food, you ate what belongs to the God of the world. Thank and praise he who spoke and the world came into being. So, on the one hand, you could say, Abraham had the first Chabad house. That's, you know, yeah. you, you have people over for Friday night, you know, so you have some wine, you have some good food, and good company, then you say, by the way, how's your Judaism going? You know, you know, <laughs> and that's I plead guilty, you know, it, 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 it's 30 years, it's working. So it, 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 it's, it, that's one thing. But I'll tell you something that, that bothered me always as a child is to take this a little bit further. It, it, it won't bother us at the end of this, but it did bother me as a child. So let's go to the next one, 3A, uh, 3, 3B. If the wayfarer would agree to thank God, they would eat, drink, and depart. If they would not agree to thank God, Abraham, let's uh, you know, so pay me what you owe me. I'd never do that by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's called bait and switch. And no, no, yeah, just you come in, you, you, you have someone as you guess, you come as someone as you guess. They'd say, I totally don't agree with anything you told me. Say, okay, enjoy the Kabbalah fish and move on. Here, he said, no, now that you ate already, here's the bill. That doesn't sound good. And the wayfarer would ask, what do I owe you? Abraham would reply, a measure of wine is 10 coins, a measure of meat is 10 coins, a measure of bread is 10 coins. Because otherwise, who give you wine, meat, and bread in the wilderness? Say, this is, this is you know, business is business. It's, a, it's supply and demand, and there's no supply out here, buddy. So there's a, this, the, I can charge you a premium price. When the wayfarer would see no way out, they would say, blessed is God, the world is Blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So here, this is... Head on, really, it's addressing, it's really, in a way, it's addressing the, the whole Chabad perspective because, <laughs> no. <laughs> How many people would say, yeah, I say you want to put on the bill? No, you don't want to put on the bill. Oh, okay, you say that. Okay, so now he thinks, what good a thrill is that? The guy just did me a favor, right? But some FedEx guy comes in here and says Goldstein on his thing, like, you got a minute. You know, it's, it's, yeah. he, he, <laughs> so, he stop and do it. Sometimes, sure. We, we try to get them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I love you. I'm with UPS. You know, just pick them. Yeah. You know, so, so the, the, what, what is, but one could ask, what's the value of that? And certainly what I ever did, I would never do that. It's like, you just come, come. We have this, this meal. Come to my house right now. Once it's done, if you're not playing, playing the program, here's the bill. If that, that's, that can't be what it's supposed to be. So as they say here now, number two, they, they phrased it in 63, it was actually a love tap, not a money trap. Okay, entrapment of false advertising, 4A. The, as I said, the measures says that Abraham would welcome the passersby. In other words, people would come and they were passing by. So, and, and we're going to get a little more into this. It's not like he went down and invited people. People were passing by, 
And why did they pass by? They passed by because he had a name. So in their minds, they're coming to an end. They're not coming to see you for every night. They're coming to an end. Once they ate and drank, he would tell them to say a blessing, and they would ask, well, what shall we say? He would reply, say blessing is, is, is the God you know, the world is what we eat. And we ate. So once they ate, he'd say, you know something? You don't have to do this. Just recognize where the food is coming from. This is just on, on, on a moral legal end. Before we get into what, the understanding uh, what we really want to get to, just to, to, to satisfy our minds that Abraham wasn't, wasn't just trapping people. Mether states, and this is from a great rabbi of the 16th century, he, he says, the Mether says that he, and for B, Abraham would welcome the passersby. Means that Abraham, this tells that Abraham did not recruit visitors. He didn't go and recruit visitors under false pretenses. That's immoral. And you can't say that unjustifies the means. Rather, the word of his hospitality spread, and visitors would come on their own. He's got, he's, got, he's got it in, he's got food. He had a financial claim against his guests. He didn't invite them to come for free. And he had the right to forgive this claim if they chose to bless God. If they arrived expecting a free meal, it was their mistake. They should have asked them. Okay, so this is technical. It's a technicality. We're not going to satisfy ourselves with this. But the saying is, he didn't invite anyone on false pretenses. He had this thing. People got to know him. And, and, and they said, okay, it's, he had a little sign in over there. People came. They should have been expecting a bill. He said, you know something? I'll forego the bill. As long as, it, but I, I, here's what I want to satisfy me. What is that? If you look at 65, along these lines, says, if they believe that the food came from Abraham rather than from God, they would be obligated to pay. Why shouldn't they pay? He gave them good. It belonged to him. If it, so they, they, uh, there's no free lunch. But if the food came from God, which Abraham saw that he was just God's messenger to bring food to them, it was ultimately God who, who, who blessed them with the ability to give food. Abraham had no claim against them because they, they could argue that God gave it to Abraham so he could give it to them, which is what he actually believed. But now that they denied God and his ownership of the food, it was only right that they pay Abraham. If they were going to pay, there would be no limit to how much they would offer who could prepare a table in the wilderness. So in other words, they're saying on a, on a legal end, on a technical end, Abraham is saying, if you were with me, if you see the world as I see it, you don't have to pay because I see myself as God's agent. I'm wealthy and I'm able to give this to you. No problem. If you're denying that idea of God, wow, that means it's mine. But pay me. Okay. So again, was he going to make genuine <laughs> conference out of this? That's really questionable. What was the point of the, the, of the, of the exercise? I think with this, we, we satisfied that he wasn't just entrapping people for some weird uh, thing that he, he's, he's trying to get to, to, to some some objective that we don't even understand actually but he wasn't entrapping anyone he wasn't inviting anyone for a free meal and then, then uh, turning the tables on them he had an inn they came in as an uh, they, they they came to the place as an inn they should have expected to pay and now he was going to relieve them of the of the money if under certain circumstances so what was he doing in a way he was doing a kind of like uh, a Chabad thing he, was, he really was trying to teach people. He wanted, his goal was not only to love and care for people and teach them to love and care for each other. He wanted them to understand that, there, that there's purpose in life and there's a God and that there's and God who created them, a loving God. And therefore he delved into all of the politics. He was very knowledgeable. He was, he was a, a, a philosophy major. And the Talmud tells us, we have Chizdas in text five, we have Chizdas Setavini. We have a tradition that our patriarch Abraham's tractate, in other words, a volume of on knowledge on idolatry, had 400 chapters. <clears throat> what, what do you mean it had 400 chapters? It means he invested himself and he would sit around the table with people with wine, a filter fish, beer, a brisket, and he says, so What is it that you believe? Really? So he believed in praying to a tree or a toad or, or, or the sun. Problem is, let's talk about this. And really what he wanted to do he, is he wanted them to open themselves up, to make themselves emotionally available to thinking a little bit different. And but he, it, it was, he was trying, he wasn't trying to just coerce them and say, say a blessing, do, do this. It was trying to change their mindset and help them along. 
And if you look at text six from the, the, the previous Rebbe, the way he put it, he said, Abraham, thank you so much for this, David. Abraham would explain, <laughs> would explain with many parables and examples so that it would be well received and understood by his students. He was able to distill complex teachings about monotheism in such simple language that even lay people understood. Those who did not understand could sense the truth in his words and would acknowledge that he was right. He spoke with such passion and love for God that even those who didn't understand him felt, felt the vitality and truth in his words and were compelled to agree with him. Sometimes, and I, I've seen this with, with, with people, not with me, I'm saying, but just sometimes you could just see that someone, that they're, they're, they have a truth. They're saying something, I don't fully get it, but I, I wanted to have what he's having or she's having because there's something, there's something in the way they're speaking. So Abraham, he, he made it in a, an emotionally and psychologically pleasing atmosphere. They were, even though he was an oddball, he was a, a person that he was, uh, the he, Hebrew actually means, Palmatez, it's, it's like the, from the word Ivri, like Ivrit in Hebrew, um, it says it's Aver, like a side. He was on one side of the, of, the, of the world and everybody else was on the other side. He was a counterculturalist. He was just, he was very different. And so they, they were oddballs. And here they come into this oddball, because he was well-known oddball, and he's even nice. And he smiles. And he has good briskets. And and then, and, and that's intelligent. That's good thought. And then, you see, he really means it. So it was very attractive. And he, he and Sarah, we find that in, in the Torah, that he and Sarah really impacted many, many people. They started to, to bring people towards monotheism. Now, that was for most of the people. What would happen in text seven, which really brings us more to, to the, the essence of what our discussion is about today, says in text seven, says when Abraham would so, saw that some people did not take to any of his explanations, this is what he, 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 what is he, how did he understand it? This was because they were encased in an unusually resistant and coarseness of things holy. No, sometimes we have we have a, a psychological um, block, and and people have told me that. I, I've had people say, I, I wish I could believe that something even I, just, I had this growing up. I, I just I just can't get there. Faith is like falling in love. You know, it's, it's either you do or you don't. It's it's it's, it's and and if someone has a block a block a blockage to that. What do you do with that? So here, because it was a blockage to faith in God, he would put them in a bind create just enough pressure to break through their unusually coarse resistance. Once the crust was broken through, his previous arguments would begin to resonate with them at least partially, and they would recognize God. They would then say, blessed is the God of the world, is true to you. And putting someone into a position to get their attention, and I don't want to, maybe it's not, it works against my interest to use that as an example, but just as an example, there's a, a Chabad <coughs> organization which has uh, is it's uh, quite large today and, and has a lot of work today. It's it is um, addressing um, Jewish inmates in the penal system called the Aleph Institute, and they they have a captive audience, you know. So and uh, and it's actually very effective mm -hmm. because people are looking for something, and and, and the pre that that pressure the amount of shove and all of it. That pressure kind of dispels a lot of distractions that maybe they weren't didn't interest them in a different light. So he wasn't putting them in the prison, but he's, he was he was clamping down a little bit, getting their attention to say, you know, something you're, you're I, I see there's something you know getting you're, you're not open. And what, what the devil was saying here is that he never actually charged anybody anything. He never actually did that, but he he would use that as a little bit. You know, it, it, uh, leverage. Yeah, but you know, there's been tell look look at the televangelists any channel on Sundays. But there are people that have gone into the penal system, not of Jewish faith, to um, bad word. I can't think of it, but the only one I can propagandize. They, yeah, missionaries. But they're, uh, but they're missionaries. Yeah, you know, they sure, go, sure, now they're in course. prisons. And so there are many Jews in prison. Yeah. There was a, an article last year. There was a, a, a Jew went to row, And this rabbi visits him all the time. When, Do you remember? Was, there was a Jew went where? He's in, in death, death row. Oh, yeah, yeah. And remember? Yeah. Yes. And so, yeah. And so this rabbi has gone to him and has 
helped him uh, as he should as he should and so this is not this might be the beginning mm -hmm. of that. I mean, you know, we don't prophesize. We don't knock on doors and our students. Except and, to Jews. What's that? Except to Jews. Well, yeah. right. But yeah. we don't knock on people. My mother had, had um, the Jehovah's Witness came to her house and, and he showed him the too. door, right? <laughs> and he said he wants to talk <laughs> about his Mark religion. Yeah. So my mother said, well, terrific. She says, I'll listen to you, but first you can listen to me. <laughs> and they said, well, we're not allowed to do that. And my mother said, okay. And shut the door. That was the end of that. I think they took her off the list. But so that this has been going on. So yeah. to, to make him look negative. Right. I know. So I guess, right. So I, I, I guess I shouldn't have brought the, 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 no, 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 the penal don't. system thing, but but here it was really the leverage of saying, maybe I get your attention with this. Now. What so to, if, if you take a look, really what we're saying is that Abraham. Let me, let me take it to a different place. But in my life, there's someone I uh, know has passed away, and he um, is the, uh, the, the child of someone who good friends of people around here, and he was absolutely opposed to anything religious in a way that I would say probably the most of anyone I've ever encountered, in a way that even when he got sick, and usually, no way he's in foxhole. He, he, uh, he, he asked his parents, you know, don't light those shops again. It, it was, he was, he was uh, diagnosed on a Friday. I mean, what do you lose by lighting those shops again? Maybe it's just right. I, ne I never met someone so, so very little. Help. And he really, I would be sometimes in the office, I would wave, you know, I, I, friendly guy. And he, he didn't. No, bark at me, but he really was not interested in a relationship. Once he was in a hospital bed, I would come visit him. And he didn't become observant. He actually asked me to please, he said, I know you're going to do my funeral. I have, I have no say. Please make sure no one thinks I believe what you believe. <laughs> no. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I did. No problem. You got it. Yeah, but the thing is, we ended up with a, with a sort of friendship. I don't know what was going on in his mind, but I think something penetrated because I was going regularly, and he was in a position. I think he was a little more open to hear. It, now, why did I keep going there? He doesn't want to see me. Doesn't want me to do his funeral. He doesn't. He doesn't you know. It doesn't like the fact that I pretty much just dance. Um, okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it's because this is he's my brother, and um, and I, my, I I don't there's no scoreboard where you know if if he made a blessing then I get some bonus from Crown Heights or something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just it, it's it's. I, I want to, and I believe people need a connection with God. They need to, people need a connection with themselves. A connection with God and a connection with themselves come together. So I, I just wanted to help. And even if he wasn't so nice to me, I'm trying to see beyond it because. Yeah. Did you ever ask him if he had a negative experience? You know, his, his parents told me about something happened when he was growing up, and, and, and we probably yeah, they they had. They, they, I never asked him. Yeah, she, she, they told me about a traumatic experience and they explained it. That I, but this is, you know, he was 30 years past that. It was, yeah. but sometimes, sometimes things that happen negatively cause you to maybe internalize them more as opposed to being able to say, oh, I'll put it here and right. I'm going to go there. And, I, and I met people, and and that was one of the things I bore, I, I, I bore in mind also. So it, it's not I don't think it personally. It's like, yeah, he doesn't even know me. He he got traumatized. He's burned, and he sees that in me. I, I want I want I want to see beyond <laughs> that to see him. You need a therapy. What? <laughs> yeah. So if you look at text eight, this is uh, the quote they brought here is from uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was uh, chief rabbi of the uh, British Empire, an amazing, great guy, uh, brilliant. And uh, he was at a banquet 
with the Chabad uh, representatives in 2011 and uh, was there. And he, he, made, he has a quote here. It's, most people look at others and see what they see. Great people look at, at others and see what they are. The greatest of the great, and the devil is the greatest of the great, look at others and see what they can become. And therefore, that's, that was Abraham. He was looking at people saying, you know, I, I, you're too precious to let me just, you let you just, I don't want you to just walk out of here and not have a consciousness of something that can help you, something higher than you. So I'm going to get your attention. I'm going to get your attention to saying, you know something? You don't believe in the whole God thing, so why do you think you get this for free? Yeah, he didn't charge them, but he was he was using whatever tightening the screws. Text nine. We may might suggest by at least by way of illusion, Abraham's words put them in a financial bind, and this considered forced them to consider their inner advice. Now, this I can tell you just because of the words being translated from this is not supposed to be vice, it's supposed to be vice. V I S E. It's not a, a vise is is like a, a, a tight grip. In other words, Abraham used two things here. So first of all, before we go to that, Abraham's approach was that everyone's valuable, everyone has a soul, everyone deserves a connection with God. I want to help them that, that connection with God. I'm going to invest my resources into that. And my intellect into that and try to and friendship and try to help people understand it. And I'm even going to use um, some leverage, which I don't like being leveraged, but it's, it's the way it is. Now, here that everyone points out that the, the leverage he used itself had significance, just that he had leverage. He chose very carefully this leverage. Because it 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 was an illusion. It was a, a, an a, a ALL illusion, or it was a metaphor for what he thought that they needed to hear. What is, what's a financial bind? A bind is it's a vice. They're feeling constricted, and that is that the vice of their own coarseness and resistance to holiness. One of the things that Torah talks about, and we have it throughout Torah. One of the things in Torah, and and it's if you look. At, uh, at, at the Torah has has uh, certainly has a very central uh, narrative about the, the the slavery in Egypt, and that was that's how we formed this into a people. When we came out seven weeks later, we got the Torah. It's very big, but one of the things that the Torah consistently going through the forty years of the desert is always talking about this idea of remembering that we left Egypt, and even till today there is. Considered a mitzvah that every day we should remember that we left Egypt. In the what the prayer we know as the Shema, which is actually three different sections of, of scripture, the third part of it there is there just so that every day we remember Egypt. Because if we say Shema, it, we're supposed to remember leaving Egypt. Why do I have to remember leaving Egypt? Do I have to remember uh, independence from Queen George every day? I'm, I'm happy. July 4th, I'm happy other day, so I love America, but I don't remember it every day. The idea is that the term of Egypt itself, in Hebrew, it's Mitzrayim. It, it comes, in Jewish uh, spirituality tells us, it comes from a word, and I've spoken about this here countless times, it comes from a word which means like a bind, constriction, Mitzrayim, which means, it means boundaries, it means, it means uh, um, constrictions, limitations. And we all have limitations, and we all have things that, that keep us, they get in the way of us being who we need to be. So I may wake up in the morning and say, you know, you know, right now, what do I want out of the world today? Or I have to look and say, what, what are my challenges today? Who am I? What's keeping me back? Maybe it's about how I feel about a certain person. Maybe it's my fear of, of uh, approaching that customer, whatever. But we all have bonds, we all have limitations. And in, in our faith in God and faith in ourselves, we want to be able to get beyond our limitations. Sometimes we have an emotional limitation. I just, you know, my my connection with a person, or the 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 prop, the ability to to more functionally, healthily, and and emote and and bond with that person. Here, you see, there, there's a there's a barrier. Their own coarseness and resistance to holiness. He said, "You're in a bond." He said, "I'm I'm squeezing you because you're I'm not squeezing you. You you're squeezing yourself. You're not uh, you're not allowing your your soul to breathe." 
He would help them realize that their unusually strong coarseness was the cause of their resistance to God. This realization brought them around the saying, blessed is the God of the world whose food we ate. In his discussion with them, he's saying, he's saying, you know, what's bothering you? What's getting in your way? You're being constricted by something. And therefore, him saying, you know, you know, food costs, giving them that constriction was really just an entree into saying, you know what, you're feeling it now? Okay, you're feeling that. But you can now identify and say, what are you feeling emotionally and spiritually? What's keeping you back? So that was point A of the why he used this methodology. And then text 10 says, so what did Abraham do? This is from a, a great rabbi from the 17th century. He located his inn in a barren desert, a place with no graves, dates, pomegranates, or drinking. God was there for him in this place that didn't support human habitation, and he provided with them, him with so much bounty that it sufficed to provide meat, wine, and bread for the all, all wayfarers. He, he, he did really, it was miraculous stuff. That he was able to put this all together in the desert. He worked hard. God helped him. Abraham, therefore, <laughs> fed all passersby. If they would accept this proposition, bless God without demanding proof of God, God's existence, all was good. If not, God would, pre would present them with arguments that, that prove divine providence. He would say, if as you believe, God does not meddle in our lowly affairs, because everyone believes in, in, in some higher uh, um, force. But you, you must ask yourself, who brought the wine, meat, and bread you ate to the wilderness? And you need to pay that cause. In, in, in philosophy, it's something called the first cause. Everything has a cause. Everything has a cause. Where does this come from? So even the first amoeba, whatever you say, the the, uh, the Big Bang. Where does who? How did the first amoeba come to be? So at a certain point, we may say, can't figure that one out. I can just, I can only work from the amoeba on. But on the other hand, if we want to think about it and think and allow for all possibilities, even though there's some possibilities you can't find under a, under a microscope to say, there's and, and Aristotle calls it a first cause. So, you know, how did that first amoeba get here? There is, it, it traces us back to God. And you, you need to, if you're prepared to accept it free, you're likely, if you're, if, if you're prepared to accept it for free, you're likely to agree that it came from God. Once they saw they were in a bind, namely that they were forced to consider the origin of a meal, they would admit their food was provided in the wilderness by God. They would then proclaim, blessed is the God of the world whose food we ate. In conclusion, they did not thank God to avoid the feast. Rather, Abraham used the question of the food's origin to demonstrate conclusively that God is the first cause of all existence. So he would say, okay, so let's talk about this. You have brisket in front of you. Where does that come from? And where does that come from? And, 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 and let's trace it back. So in other words, here too, the idea of paying for the food, it gave them the constriction. It was also a good teaching, a good teaching tool. Exhibit A. Okay. So now let's go to text 11. Contemporary applications. So I'm saying so, so I guess, just, <clears throat> I guess in, in you know, fast forward to today's battleground, right? Mm -hmm. You have the evolutionists, yeah, and you have the, the religious. Okay, and you break it all down, yeah, and you come to this basically you come to the stalemate. It, it, a stalemate because I can't show first cause, but you know it's First of all, it doesn't break down that, that easily necessarily. Uh, you know, uh, there are crit creationists who believe in certain level of evolution or not. But the where the, the the conversation breaks down is that even though someone who who is and you know this is you know, these conversations find me. So I, I you know and right. I speak those are really intelligent people. No one has a good answer for where the first thing came from. But the point is, let's you set that aside. We'll never even know that. But what went on? So I'll say, I believe in a big bang. I also believe in a banger. It, it wasn't a spontaneous bang. So it, it's it, this, it, it just moves, it, it breaks down because you're going to, if we're going to, I mean, technically, we're only talking about things that you can empirically see and so on. But the truth is, we're not empirically seeing a lot of stuff. The whole the carbon dating, all of this stuff is a lot of conjecture in, in all of this stuff. So if, if that it's it's I would prefer to believe, you know, so there's there's healthy science for me that's, that allows for things and for that uh, are inquisitive and open-minded enough for even things that, that can't be empirically felt. 
And then there's, there's a science that's going to be, that really is going to presuppose that there's nothing beyond what we can see. But even there, so no one ever felt a particle of gravity. How do you know gravity exists? You know gravity exists because of effects. Right? That's what, or someone knows otherwise. That, as far as I know, that's all, that's all we know. Uh, well, that's not so. How, how scientific is that? You see effects. Well, I look at the world, I see that's an effect. A lot of the scientists I met over the years, yeah. they all believe in their religion, yeah. but they all believe in the Big Bang. But very rarely did somebody say one happened without the other. Yeah. And it was fascinating to sit and listen <laughs> to people, the one person, argue both sides against the middle. <laughs> so in my conversations with people, I, mean, I guess I only have a, a, a niche. It, it, whoever I, I've dealt with over the 30 years, it, to have someone who absolutely is uh, against the idea of a first cause, I can't, I don't think anybody, uh, at the end of the day, they don't know what it is. I don't really call it God, whatever. People uh, push back against the person who's God, who cares about what I'm having for lunch. That's going to be more of the point. But the idea of a creator, when you when you drill down, uh, it, it's, it's very hard to, to get around that. One thing I wanted to mention is, um, you know, it keeps on mentioning a constraint or, you know, um, the reason why he's talking to these people, welcoming them, yeah. you know, it sort of it looks at it more of a negativity. I think the word I would use is an opportunity to have a reason to talk to them about God. I, I and I, I say I think that's great because that, that's the way we see it. I mean, it, Abraham, it, it's framed that way, that he presented it that way. It it does sound a little like a bait and switch, and then we just kind of work that out. But I'm telling you, I, when I grew up. And when I was taught this, the way I was taught it was a bait and switch. You know what I mean? I was a kid. I guess they didn't get into all this stuff. But it, it's so first you got to get past that because it's a bait and switch. I don't want to hear what this guy has to say. Okay, so it wasn't it. But what was he doing? Yes, he was. Good. He sort of giving them an opportunity. But there is, you know, there's this balance. Do I want to make someone uncomfortable? Who's, who's rushing to leave us and give me a minute for two? I don't want to. Why, why do I get into this in, in, in someone's way? No, they maybe say, you know, something. It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Text 11. This is from the Rebbe. No matter, no matter the circumstances of a Jew, he or she has a godly soul. Therefore, even while committing a sin, a Jew wants to remain a Jew and wants to do God's bidding. It follows that only the Jew's outer crust requires piercing. The internal core is intact even before the outer crust is pierced. When we apply pressure to pierce the external coarseness, our purpose is to reveal the intrinsic holiness that was already present within. The point is not, again, there's no brownie button, there's no scoreboard, there's nothing. We don't, I'm talking about here, we don't need any, we're not looking for anything from anybody. They just, they, they, it, the drive should come from a caring for people and a caring for people enough to help them have an opportunity to, to connect with something that will be good for them. If they don't want, they don't want. The lesson from Abraham's story is obvious. This is also from the 11, 12. The actions of our patriarchs, the matriarchs, point the way for their descendants. Therefore, we must behave as Abraham did and work to publicize God's presence throughout the world. Should someone ask, what was accomplished by this effort? And a lot of the observant world would ask this of Chabad. This, mm -hmm. you, guys, you guys are crazy. Let's put on throw on someone in, in Grand Central Station. What do, what do you accomplish? After all, the Jew was convinced, we convinced of the side of blessing, chant the Shema, pray, did it unwillingly without heart. And the one who put on film did so to be free of pressure. Whether they will do the mitzvah again tomorrow, we don't know. So what's the point? The other such arguments. Respond by relating the story from the Torah, which serves as a lesson to us. If in the days of Abraham, when he dealt with non-Jews before the Torah was given, this approach achieved the end goal of in God's work to Abraham, he's familiarized me to my creations. How much more so after the Torah was given when we deal with Jews who want to be Jewish and want to do God's bidding? Our efforts with these Jews are surely consistent with their inner desire. Moreover, it is likely that the gentle pressure that brought them to do one mitzvah will inspire them to do another mitzvah to the point that they will openly want to perform all the mitzvahs in their complete form. This effort to publicize the name of God in the world in a manner that makes God known to all his creation will hasten the time when measure for measure the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God 
And this will be achieved by a king who will arise in the house of David and will inspire all of Israel to walk in the path and to repair the breaches in the words of the monarchies above the written in the Lord Torah's journey to true and complete redemption by Mashiach, the rich, righteous redeemer. So I'll leave it over there, but I think the idea and the Rebbe's attitude that just struck me is uh, I have a friend, a, a rabbi in uh, 20 years old, I mean, is a, a senior rabbi in Maryland. And he has a, he, he told me about um, a, an attorney he knows who um, he, he go into Washington, D.C. every day and would come into Union Station and someone would ask him to put on film. He'd say, no. And the day after day. And finally, he said to, the, to, to his student, he said, you're not going to wear me down. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not, I, I, I'm not your guy. I keep seeing you, you keep asking me, I say, no, just why do you even bother? So he said, oh, you, you don't understand. I, I'm not here because I need you to specifically put a film. I'm here because I want you to know if someone cares. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. You keep saying no. I'm telling you, I still care. So uh, now let's see if we can unmute. And, uh, oh, so there's a chat. Oh, yeah, I, I, need, I need better glasses. I, uh, not better glasses, glasses. Uh, okay. This is, I understand com completely this perspective. However, if, if an individual does not believe, the approach is taken as offensive and impinging on their identity because of their perspective. What the Rebbe first says, first was coarseness, they, they see, uh, because of coarseness, they see as their identity, they did not see anything else. I agree with you, Leon, and that's why, it's, in what I do and the way I do it, um, I'm, I have to be very careful with that. And I don't want, to, I don't want, I don't want to be someone, and I hope that people don't experience me as someone who, where it, they say that, um, you know, that, that I don't allow them for their own perspective or their own self-image. Someone says, that's, that's me, it's me. It, like I say, even that guy who was, who, uh, you know, who was not friendly to me and uh, he insisted he doesn't believe in God. I'm not going to do that. I, actually, I, I, my father is not well. I'm going to um, I'm gonna have to leave here very soon. But um, a kid, there was a kid in our Hebrew school. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to stop the share now. Maybe I'll get Ah, now we got, now I can see more people. Hello. Um, okay, so the, uh, some of you probably heard this from me before. It's, it's, uh, in the families of Central Art Hebrew School, there are those who are more Judaically inclined, and those who are less Judaically inclined, but we don't, we don't vet them. It's, uh, you, you want your kid? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there was it's one kid, and it's a wonderful family here in Basque Ridge. They have both parents who don't believe in God. Why they send their kids to Hebrew School? Only God knows. Um, but uh, <laughs> they're nice people, and but they they make it quite clear to the children they don't believe in God, and they're um, we actually had only the youngest child here. The, the two kids were in the temple somewhere, so I was school, and the youngest kid was here, and it came time for bar mitzvah, and the mother calls me, I frantic because I see doesn't want to have a bar mitzvah. Shocking. <laughs> so, 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 so I said, well, why do you think that is? I don't know. <laughs> so what do you want me to do about it? Can you talk to him? So, so I can talk to him, but you know, I'm not gonna fix him. Uh, I'll talk to him. Bring him to my own, sure. So he sits down um, in the office and I say, uh, well, his name's Ross. Uh, Ross, why don't you uh, why don't you have a Why should I? Good question. Your brothers did. That's a lot. Not a good question. <laughs> um, I said, I said, your parents would really like it. Your grandparents would love to come up from Boca. And and uh, and so you have a said, so they can come up, but it's 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 a hassle. Oh, it's a waste of money. I, I just don't I don't want to do And like I so said, we go to a restaurant somewhere and then and, and have, I'll have a 13th birthday party. I don't need it. Rabbi, could you speak a little slower and louder? Right. We're having trouble. I'm missing some of your great points. Um, I mean, maybe you need to wear a microphone or something, but we're, we're missing some of the great points because you're, well, I love the way you're speaking, but you're doing fast and, and, and you drop off. I'm, yep. I'm sorry. I intend to do that. You're new here. I, uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I'm going to, thanks for keeping me honest here. 
So he, he, this, this kid, you know, he says he doesn't want to have a bar mitzvah. So I said, okay, so I don't have a bar mitzvah. No, 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 as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to, I'm not speaking for your parents. I'm not going to push it. I don't, I don't care. However, for me, I don't teach Hebrew school anymore. The only time I have to spend with kids is in, in, in preparation for bar mitzvah. So I get, we have good conversations. So how about we just have the conversations? Forget the bar mitzvah. You don't have to have a service. You don't have to have anything. But at least, well, I don't, I'm not going to have the time to talk to you. How about we talk? So he says, okay, but it depends what you're talking about. <laughs> so I said, I, I don't have a curriculum for you. He said, I don't want to talk about God. So I won't mention God. You talk about other things? Yes. Okay. So if I mention God, you point it out to me, I'll shut up. So we, we meet a few times. And uh, I didn't mention God. And then he says, uh, says to me, you know something? I just saw who we spoke about. Community. I don't, I don't remember. One of these for sure was community, Jewish identity. Um, and then he says, you know, I decided I want to have a bar mitzvah. But not for me. I didn't, I didn't push you. Why? So he said, because, you know, I'm Jewish, whatever that means. And it's what Jews do. And I, I belong to a group. Why should I be different? I'll have a bar mitzvah. So I said, great. I said, but I, I want you to, to do one thing for me. He said, what? He said, don't mention God by the bar mitzvah. Really? He said, I, I think I can deal with that. At least not in English. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might get your life back, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't understand won't hurt you. So the, the, the so, you know, what I'm saying that is in response to, to, to the point on the chat, I'm not, I, I, I want to be respectful of different people's self-image, and I'm not, I don't think I'm a pushy guy, but I, I, I do have an opinion, and I, have a, I, I, I do have a, an objective. The objective is to be embracing of people, to care about people, and I believe that people do better in this game we call life, which doesn't always feel like a game, um, feeling, knowing of their own godliness and, uh, and purpose and connected to them. That's to respond to that question. Let's get one more here. Yes, it does seem very quiet without a microphone. It's hard to hear. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, so we may get me a microphone or I may wise up and keep my voice loud, but it's about my own consciousness. So as I say, this is a work in progress and uh, we made it through the second one. Pretty good. Okay. Thank you. Very question, much. question about Thank you. you. You said that that poor fellow who <clears throat> was sick and yeah. still didn't want you to be involved in his spiritual care, or what was what was the uh, what was the 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 uh, the final thoughts on that? We had I really trouble hearing. Yeah, so he, uh, we, while I, I knew him for a good number of years from a distance because I, I knew his parents well and he really did not want any close connection with me. We just, uh, I would say hello and he would say hello back if I saw him, but he never, he never stepped, stepped in the building. And I only saw him in his parents' office or home. Um, during my time visiting, I've made a point to visit him quite often in, in the hospital and, and in rehab. And uh, and I, I think we 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 created a, a bond. He did resign himself to the idea that I would be performing his funeral. Um, he did not tell me he believes in God. He didn't tell me it, it, there was there's no like stories. There. And all of them, wow, you know, he, he, he had this uh, spiritual epiphany. I do believe we definitely he and I became friends. That's for sure. That changed. And I do believe he opened up a little bit. That's all. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. It's not, it's not this. This uh, it, it, you know this inspiring little you know thirty second YouTube bit. I did this and I and I said that and all of a sudden he changed his mind. Didn't happen. But uh, I, I think that that people ultimately there it's there and the desire for a connection is there and it can be layered and layered and layered and layered and and, and everybody's got their own situation. But I never give up on the idea that so in there there's there's a desire for connection. I know that you're in a rush, but yeah. maybe the next time, can we talk about uh, Nishamos and 
you know souls yeah. yeah where they come back okay so they there's no new souls they come back because you yeah. talked about you know so, so and, and sd is asking about the thing now we're on a curriculum so i don't even know what they got for next week but i um supposed to talk about the souls and i guess like uh, transmigration of souls uh reincarnation stuff like that i'm up for that i don't know if it's going to fit into next week or not but we can try yeah, it's only because you mentioned Harsinai, where the first Jew was really from Harsinai, not uh, Abraham. From, from, from Sinai, yes. Um, yeah, so. and the, right, so we, you, we are all more Jewish than Abraham and Sarah were. That's, that's... Right, well, because can a Jewish soul come huh? back as... Yeah. Does a Jewish soul come back as a Jewish soul, or can it go into a non-Jewish soul? I mean, like, do these that's, souls, that's how a, do they come back? A good question. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. No, it's just not for now. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I want to get into that at all. I, I'm, 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 I'm not a recording. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to answer this for you? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah.